Let me rewind the clock back to 1989, back to when the Thundercats and the original He-Man and She-Ra and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were featured on a television set that only had four channels. <laughs> back to when the Game Boy had just landed, convincing all of us that the future was finally here and we were gaming on it. And to when school playgrounds were filled with kids in fluorescent shell suits singing Kylie Minogue at the top of their voices with absolutely no shame whatsoever. Now let me take you to the east end of London and a council flat. It's eight o'clock in the evening, which in this flat means lights out. Two words that would provoke two very different reactions from the children of the house. For the six-year-old boy, it would lead to pleadings, oh, please, no, just five more minutes, I'll be really good, I promise. But from his older sister, the eight-year-old girl, it would lead to a silent, happy nod. Because for her, those two words, lights out, were words of freedom. They signaled a time for when the magic could begin, a magic that lay in discovering new friends and going on new adventures with no one to watch her or judge her or disturb her. So come eight o'clock every evening in this tiny flat, as soon as the light was switched off and the bedroom door was clicked shut, she would grab the book from underneath her pillow, scuttle over to the bedroom window, creep under the curtains, and by the yellow light of the street lamp outside, read the words and meet the friends that she had been longing to get back to all day all of which probably explains these glasses. <laughs> now let me fast forward to 2017. I am, of course, no longer that eight-year-old girl. I'm also waking up in a very different bed in a very different part of London. This bed is situated in a hospital ward, and the windows are shuttered and blocked. I've just woken up from a surgery that has saved my life, but it hasn't just saved it, it's also changed the course of it in ways that I won't understand for a good while yet. Now, there are moments in all of our lives, a single moment which shifts the plates of our world and forces us to navigate through a new one. For me, bed number eight at St. Thomas's Hospital in Paddington was where one of the most significant plate-shifting moments of my life occurred. Now, the reasons for me being in that hospital for this story isn't what's significant. It's what happened afterwards and the choices that I made whilst in that bed that matters the most. Because it was then, in that moment, that eight words came to me and refused to leave. Eight words for the title of a book, a children's book, about one of the biggest global humanitarian crises of our times, the refugee crisis. Now, it's a crisis I'd come to learn about in depth through years of delivering aid convoys to Calais and Dunkirk and trying to convince others to do the same. But I use that word crisis not because of the millions of people on the move trying to flee wars and man-made horrors. I use it to reference the ways that our governments and the media and the most racist voices surrounding us have chosen to view our fellow human beings. Human beings who've had the willpower and the dignity to try and survive, to try and live, but who have been deemed unworthy of our sanctuary and our help, even of saving. Now, I've been a human rights campaigner, a feminist, and an aid worker for as long as I can remember. Those were what I want to do. Those were the roles that I dreamed of doing. But stuck in that hospital bed, unable to move, unable to galvanize or march or protest or write letters, I needed to find a new way, a new vehicle to express my anger and frustration, feelings that hadn't gone away with surgery, and if anything, had grown more powerful. The eight words that came to me in that hospital bed and that wouldn't leave me were simple and direct. They were the boy at the back of the class. I knew that those words couldn't possibly belong to anything else other than a children's book. So that's what I set out to write, even though I had zero experience of being a published author. I left that hospital bed in July 2017. By September, housebound and bedbound, the first draft was complete, inclusive of some pretty awful drawings um, that I submitted to my agent. You're laughing. You can laugh. 
Right, I thought. Now, if I get really lucky, maybe, just maybe, a publisher might pick up the book within the next year or two, especially as the news channels at the time were still showing what was going on in Syria and were still covering the results of the cruelty of hard borders. But it didn't take a year. It didn't take six months. It didn't take one month. By some miracle, a publisher had picked up the book within just two weeks of me submitting it. Right, I thought. Now, if I could just get even more, just a little bit more luckier, then maybe there might be some children out there who want to pick up a book about a refugee boy who has made the journey from war to peace, has come to the UK with nothing but a red backpack to remind him of everything that he had lost and everything that he might never see again. What happened next, and what is still happening, has gone beyond the boundaries of anything that I could have wished for. The few kids that I'd hoped might pick up the book suddenly turned into 1,000 kids, and then 10,000, and then 50,000, and then 100,000. And the children picking up the book weren't just reading it, they were using it to self-mobilize. And along with them, their grandparents, and parents, and teachers, and librarians, and friends were mobilizing too. First came the emails. Emails from parents and grandparents telling me that for the first time ever, their children were asking questions about the refugees in their own family history. About their grandfather who survived the Holocaust and who had made it to the UK and forged a life for himself. About their parents who had fled Somalia or Poland or Russia or Kosovo to make a life for themselves in Birmingham or Glasgow or Manchester. Then came the letters, beautiful letters from children and entire classrooms asking and telling me that they wanted to help and how they could help. And then came the tweets and the DMs and newspaper articles about how children weren't just asking the grown-ups of their world to help them raise money for refugee charities, but also to help get the book into other schools so that they could be mobilized too. And then came the most unprecedented of all actions, of all reactions. Letters written by children to the Prime Minister. Beautiful, brave, courageous letters, wanting to know why it was that their government was failing to act humanely. And these letters didn't just go out to the Prime Minister, there were letters also being sent to the Home Office, even to Buckingham Palace, wanting to know, pleading, asking, putting a business case forward for why it is the powers that be should keep borders open, should help refugees and stop the wars and the climate change disasters that were taking place around the world. Every email, every tweet, every message, every reaction, every question, every conversation that I see being triggered by the book is a signifier to me of something I had forgotten as an adult and which I really want to remind you all about today. And that is that when it comes to understanding and writing the wrongs of this world, it's our children who get it first. Our intrinsic sense of right and wrong, and of justice, real justice with no excuses, is never so powerful, never so unshakable as it is when we were children. All of us sitting here know this. We know that the eight-year-old version of ourselves would never tolerate or accept the things that we might accept and tolerate as adults, would never look away and shove aside and blind ourselves to things that we know to be wrong, not unless we were deeply frightened. Now, it's been my honor over the course of this year to tour countless schools. I've been to schools in picturesque, beautiful villages where there isn't even a brown face to be seen, let alone a refugee child, to entire cities where refugee children are, of course, a beloved and marked presence. And in every one of those schools, the questions and the looks of disbelief and shock that I see on children's faces when they hear what the grown-ups of their world are doing to their world and to the people in it reminds me of why I want to write for children. Because whether consciously or unconsciously, each of the children that I meet is doing something really beautiful. They're beginning to think for themselves and beginning to ask the questions that we need them to ask of us. A few weeks ago, I gave a school talk at a beautiful school in the middle of nowhere. And after I'd finished, a little girl came running up to me to ask if she could ask me a question. I said, yes, of course, thinking that she wanted to talk about the book or maybe some of my works in the refugee camps. 
But her question was about none of those things. It was simply, Miss, do you really think we can all help, even me? The beauty of that question absolutely floored me, and I needed a moment to gather myself. The answer that I could give her, of course, was definitely, yes, you. To which she smiled, nodded, ran off back out into the playground, just as children do when they've stabbed you in the heart with their words. <laughs> she was seven years old. Her name was Tammy. And she, just like every child, asking questions, reading books, and staying up to imagine a better world long after the lights have gone out is a reminder to me that no one is too small to make a change or to want to make a change. And that it's our children who are the most powerful, most profound, and most beautiful vehicles of the change that we need right now. All they need is a story worth staying up for. Thank you.